Tailoring is a completely different craft to dressmaking, and some of you likely have questions about tailoring and what it's like to be a historical tailor. Because I'm definitely not a professional tailor, I really cannot provide any advice on what it is like, which is why I wanted to bring in someone who does know. I reached out to Tom Van Hethoff, who is a professional bespoke historical tailor, and he agreed to an interview. I asked him both questions that I was curious about and also questions that you all requested too. I'm Tom, Tom Van het Hof. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm close to 26 years old. I'm a historical bespoke tailor by profession. And by historical, I mean, I usually make things for my clients that require a historical background. I've been trained as a, well, modern tailor, so to speak, at the Master Tailoring Institute in Amsterdam. But before that, I've had close to four years of autodidactic to learning. It's cool to know that you actually come from a modern background, but then you've adapted it to something that maybe you're more interested in. What are the five to 10 things that you would tell someone who's just starting out and who wants to get deeper into tailoring? I think the most important thing that I learned from my very first project, and this is something that actually applies to basically any craft or well, also a lot of theoretical things. Don't shy away from making a mistake and don't let your failures withhold you from pursuing it. If you want it and you um, see that you're getting better, that's just basically the best learning aid there is. The, the biggest mistake I think anyone who wants to start out with this craft is to immediately stop doing it as soon as you stumble upon your first mistake. Or for example, you completely ruin something you make and then think this is not for me, let's just stop this right away. The second tip I would say is don't be afraid to ask questions. There's always things you don't know or are not sure of or you just don't understand. So well, I just asked my grandma for it because well, grandma so, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a fact. Just started asking questions on the internet, for example, Googling questions and just coming up with answers or spending hours thinking, how would I do this if I can't find an answer for it? Stretching your own imagination into something you haven't quite done yet, but feel confident enough in doing so. The third thing I think is most important is uh, know what to invest in. When you be economical about everything and just pick the cheapest option for everything. That's just not something uh, I can recommend. Don't break your bank, but don't be afraid to invest in some long-term things. And what are the five top tailoring tools that you think are essential to start making tailored garments? I don't think uh, there's uh, tools I personally work with that are exclusive to this. So the first thing I'd say, a decent pair quality scissors. There's a big difference between a very cheap one and a moderately priced one. If you spend 50 or 60 euros on it, you get one that's not the highest grade of quality, but one that you can resharpen plenty of times. Whereas with a cheap one, yeah, it's just better to buy a new one, which in the end is going to cost you a lot more. Uh, secondly is a proper sewing machine, be it one your grandmother gave you or a second-hand one you found in the thrift shop or just, well, a new one. Don't be afraid to spend a little bit on it because you will get your entire worth of money out of it that you spend on it. A pair of drawing utensils for pattern drafting, a nice set of pencils, 2H is my preferred type. Of course, a, a French curve, other things that are required for measuring and making geometrical drawings on pattern paper. A strong quality measuring tape. And those you can buy very cheaply, but eventually they'll stretch out. You need to buy proper quality cloth, but not one that breaks the bank. When you choose, for example, a very nice, moderately priced uh, fabric for the outer, you can, when it's just a practice round, for example, be more economic when it comes down to the quality lining or the quality of buttons or the quality of uh, yarns. Because that's something that I think is uh, much more important to invest in as soon as you progress and see yourself becoming better and also become more comfortable with spending more on something that may or may not uh, turn out to be completely as you want it. The last thing is proper quality pins. I think pins is something that a lot of people, including me, really underestimate. There's nothing that can ruin, for example, a waistcoat lining or a nice silk dress more than using pins that aren't of good quality and thereby just poke an entire hole in your uh, fabric and sometimes even pulling threads out with them. And the same actually applies to sewing needles, but I think that's 
self-explanatory. Lastly, always be open-minded about the learning progress. After a while, I became cocky, but eventually, when I went to the Master Tailoring Institute, you're taught by people who have done it for the biggest part of their lifetime. And if they know something better than you do, they know something better than you do. So always be open to learn new things, even though the way you learned it from yourself may actually be the better one for you. But you should always be more open-minded about the learning progress and seeing different perspectives from different people, because the more you know, the more you can eventually combine the certain knowledges from different people and your own and ultimately come up with the way that works best for you, the perfect amalgamation. How can you find work in historical tailoring? So is it something that you can make a career out of? Obviously you have, but do you feel like it's easy to make a career out of? And is work difficult to find? Yes, you can find work in it, just like with any other profession, as long as you really want to do it and you are able to distinguish yourself and become good enough to pursue to pursue it in a full-time way for example you can be hired for an opera for a theatrical institute because they often require historical garments for stage plays and such that that's kind of well not the easy way but those are the places that are quite often looking for people if you really want to go for a career being self-employed yeah, that's a bit more difficult, but that's just something that anyone who is a self-employed uh, experiences. It's really about making a difference, showing that you have something that is unique, that not everyone, and actually preferably, that only you are able to offer. Be unique and let people know that if they want something in that regard, that you are the best person to go to. Like you said, filling a gap in the market is the most important thing that you can do yeah. in anything that you do in life outside of even just tailoring. Just to cover things that are different between contemporary tailoring and historical tailoring. Firstly, what are some of the things that were commonly left out of patterns back then that were thought of as common knowledge and might not be so obvious to us now? One thing I noticed as soon as I started researching vintage and antique pattern drafting systems, which I actually started to study before I learned about the contemporary ones. So that's something I really immediately noticed is that often they don't include the sleeves and that's usually because in the entire tailoring manual which started to become commonplace after the 1830s usually it was an entire book about drafting torsos and skirts and the collars and just one page which um, consisted of yeah and by the way this is how you draw the sleeves but the drafting systems for sleeves was always proportional to the build of the wearer and the size of the chest the armhole the shoulders so you only need to know a few basic calculations in order to completely deduct a uh, sleeve pattern. Another thing is, for example, the, the color facing or the lapel facing. Nowadays, it's usually... Um, oh. Well, hello there. Oh, we have a visitor. <laughs> Oh, this is the first dog on the channel. And things like, yeah, the, 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 the pattern for the linings, for the pockets, for the pocket flaps, for the fly facings, for the trousers, etc. Those things were just, well, considered to be very common knowledge. So what would you say is the biggest difference in tailoring for, for both men and women um, in the past versus what is done today? And what are the main things that tailors could learn now from tailors of the past and also vice versa? Fashion has always been uh, an important part of bespoke tailoring because while well, people who could afford it were also the ones who could afford to dress according to the latest fashions. But I think a very big difference that was taken into account all those many years ago is craftsmanship was extremely cheap but the garments were also much more labor intensive which meant that they also became a lot more expensive relatively speaking. And because it was such an enormous investment uh, tailors back in those days be it for men or women always took into account that fashions may change, so that you always need to um, apply enough inlays in certain places to provide an entire recut of a garment, or well, wearers, they often changed their sizes during their lifetime, so throughout their entire lifetime things could be altered. And another thing that was very important to take into account is that it may pass down from generation to generation. So it was even meant to transcend the fashion of not just one lifetime, but sometimes even multiple lifetimes. They were made with the idea that even if fashions changed very drastically, it could still be to a certain degree adjusted to those fashions. 
you know, when you mention that, the, the best example that I know of this is when you look at early 1890s gowns and you can yeah. see the remnants of the bustle where they sort of took the bustle fabric and cartridge pleated it and made it into something different using the massive yeah. length of fabric that you got with the bustle. You also see that much more often on ladies fashion because their fashions changed every year, whereas a suit made in 1880 could well have been worn all the way into the 1910s. I was going to ask quickly, what size seam allowances do you use? This is kind of a random question, but I love to ask it. Let's just say for a regular mid to heavyweight quality so I'd say vintage quality woolen for a jacket. In the center back, I leave about three to four centimeters of inlay. The side seam of the back is about two to three centimeters. On the side panel of a jacket, I put sometimes up to five to six centimeters of inlay. Because, well, that's what I did back in the day. But when it's down to fabrics that don't stretch and press as easily, because you need to press it in accordance to the waist um, shape, then it's three in the back and two to three centimeters in the side seams at max. So how do frock coat style vents differ from a modern side vent? Frock coats, as we know them from the 19th century, became more fashionable. Those slits already had started to disappear because no men wore ceremonial swords. And special ceremonial wear was of course based on 18th century clothing. So that was already uh, taken care of. And side vents, as we now know it, with a regular suit jacket or a lounge coat for the British, those only came into existence properly in the second half of the 1930s. All the way up to then, it was either no vents or a center vent. And there are, of course, exceptions with some types of overcoats in the 19th century, which had some sort of double vent system. But generally speaking, double vents, as we know them nowadays, only became into existence after not Edward VIII, but his brother, George started wearing them in the later half of the 1930s. I think they do have some special connection, which is just a matter of convenience. But now instead of poking a sword through it, it's just for more access to your pockets. How do you get a tailored item to look nice while standing and still be comfortable while you're sitting down? Because obviously the two completely change the garment. It's quite common knowledge that a jacket uh, you should always unbutton as soon as you sit down. Things like jackets, it's not necessarily meant to only look good when you're standing, but as soon as you're sitting down, you're in a position of comfort. And when you're comfortable, you can just unbutton things. Usually a single breasted jacket, you really need to unbutton because it also puts too much stress on the buttonhole and the button itself, unless it's a very baggy jacket, in which case, it's fine, but it still is very restricted. And usually double-breasted jackets are made in a way that you can leave those buttons because they require a bit more of a hassle to uh, cl open and close. And I'm guessing when you fit your clients, you probably have them sit down as well. And Yes, exactly. You uh, j Just to make sure that everything is all right. What would you say are the best arms eye set shapes for the greatest range of movement for a fitted garment? In terms of menswear, that's an extremely easy question to answer. Uh, the one that's the highest and still most comfortable. One that's close fitting with a sleeve that has a lot of um, ease put into it, which provides, well, actually all the movement you can require in a jacket. Because a jacket will always restrict a little bit, but when you have a nicely fitted arm side, which is slightly the shape of an egg, it's a bit difficult to fit because yeah, you, you can't make an arm all any higher if you've already cut it out, make a pattern with the highest possible armhole you can get and then just fit it until it gets comfortable and you don't feel it after a few minutes of wearing it. How do you get such nice crispy corners on things? When speaking of corners, I immediately think of, well, pointy corners, so to speak, like with a bottom of a waistcoat or lapels, for example. The best thing I've learned in that regard is to not stitch a perfect corner but to round it up just a little bit, sometimes even just one stitch on an angle, turn it inside out, you almost always get a perfect pointy corner. And then it's just a matter of just clipping the seam allowances an appropriate amount, pressing it firmly and then letting it rest and dry with a weight on it, be it a piece of wood or as I use an antique iron on top of it, just in order to flatten it out and make sure it just rests it's interesting that that is the case because it would feel like that would be very counterintuitive, but it works. You just need to have done it a few times in order to believe it. What are five essential types of fabrics that someone should have in their stash if they want to get going with historical tailoring? The first one I'd say is a very thin, lightweight, modern wool. 
in order to make something out of and then realize that you absolutely can't do period tailoring a very thin wool by means of learning a valuable lesson. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule, but when you work with one of those very fancy Italian woven super 200 fabrics, it's really hard to make a frock coat out of that because it requires a lot of pressing, a lot of stretching, and that's something those fabrics almost always are not made for. Afterwards, I'd say a very nice thick wool, not necessarily an overcoating, but just a very nice heavyweight flannel or something like that in order to experience how nice and how perfect it is for period tailoring and how much you can actually do with it in comparison to thinner fabrics. Next to that, I think a very nice tweed because tweed is a completely different kind of fabric, but it's my all-time favorite fabric to work in because of the variety in colors, weaves, textures, and it's just beautiful. And I think it also provides a very nice experience in working with something that's very robust, but still very refined at the same time. And then I'd say a nice silk, be it a Dupioni silk for something a bit more modern, or a very nice taffeta or crab silk in order to just figure out if you like working with that because it requires a whole different approach as to working with a tweed or flannel or thin wool. And lastly, a nice velvet because velvet is a very prominent fabric, especially in historical uh, circles, be it for a collar or a cuff detail or just entire jackets or suits made out of them. And again, velvet is an extremely difficult fabric to uh, work with in the beginning because it shifts everywhere except a good way. Eventually, it's very nice um, learning process and again as soon as something of velvet is finished and it looks nice it's the most satisfying feeling ever. <laughs> what about for lining fabrics what would you recommend? As long as a lining is made from a natural fiber or at least a blend with a natural fiber if completely natural fibers is a bit too expensive then I'd say it's all fine and dandy. The weight of the fabric and the thickness of the lining fabric that I just let depend on the thickness and the function of the garment you're making. What are good resources for learning to draft historical patterns and what drafting systems do you use? I use two books and they're both Dutch and very rare so I'm afraid I can't really recommend those specifically. That's also a very difficult question because drafting manuals were of course made but manuals about making things were very rare. It was almost exclusively done uh, from mouth to mouth and practical learning and never writing. If I have to recommend just one really historical book when it comes down to menswear, but also a lot of techniques that can be applied to pretty much anything, that's uh, this book. I think a lot of people already know this one, The Victorian Tailor. It's basically a very good guide in order to understand how garment construction was done, which techniques were used, and also pattern drafting. Though it does take a few days in order to get your head around the very complex drafting systems from those days. Where is the best place to find old books about tailoring or about just couture in general? So for instance, about the House of Worth or one of these other couture houses? I have no idea. <laughs> that uh, I usually buy my pattern books uh, completely by accident. I buy them sporadically. I can't really think of a single place to buy them. But I just say uh, go to any antique markets, secondhand shop or eBay listing you can find. What are the tips that you can give for improving hand stitching? So obviously hand stitching is a big part of tailoring because you finish a lot of things by hand. Just keep on doing it even when you start hating it because that's just all part of the process. You just have to work yourself through it and eventually you start liking it again. It, it takes a lot of time. You will get quicker with the hand sewing, but it's never as fast as machine sewing. It's worth the effort because it usually looks, looks so much better and so much neater and you can actually see how much effort you put into it. And it's also very nice for your clients to see. What is the best way to do pad stitching and lapel shaping? This is a massive part of tailoring and it is more challenging than it looks. Again, the same as with everything, uh, do it a lot. And I think the best advice I can give is to try not to make your stitches too small, but also not too big. The, the stitch density really dictates how nice and how firm a lapel is going to roll. What size would you say? Three quarters of a centimeter. Still kind of small, but not... But yeah, not, not insanely small. Another thing that I always do is I, I constantly shape it. So if this is the lapel and I start shaping the roll of it, I always shift it through and completely keep it rolled. So it just becomes sort of a tube. 
and it provides a very nice permanent crease. And afterwards, I press the second half of it flat so that it maintains its shape. And then you get this very nice natural permanent roll. Is there any other things that you feel like would help to improve someone's collar making or lapel making? The best thing I could advise against that is don't immediately start making the collar or lapels on the jacket itself, but just try those out separately in order to see how it looks, how it goes and how the construction works. Because I've ruined a lot of jackets in my early stages with the collar. So then you've had the pain of making an entire jacket and then it completely falling flat when the collar needs to be put on. Just cut out a lapel, put a piece of interlining on it, cut out a piece of collar, put an interlining on it, just make it, construct it, and then hang it around the neck of your dress form in order to see how it drapes, how it fits, and the things you can potentially improve. Don't practice on what's to be the final garment, practice separately. Collars and lapels are very intimidating. When you've done it a few times, you get a hang of it, you develop your own preferable methods, and that makes the whole lot more comfortable. How do you know when to interface what? There are definitely some sections of a garment that are going to have to be interfaced. Which ones are they usually? With a jacket, uh, the most interfacing always needs to go into the chest and front panel area and uh, the collar. And besides that, I don't use a lot of uh, canvassing, sometimes in the sleeve hat in order to provide a nice roll to it. In terms of yeah, the thickness, how stiff it needs to be or how soft it needs to be in accordance to what sort of fabric you're using. That's something that you just need to build an instinct on. One thing I always notice is that it's always better to use an interlining that's a bit heavier than one that is too light. There, there's no such thing as too much support unless you like something to have a very slouchy and loose fit. Even then you can, you can do that with a very firm interlining. What are the differences, would you say, the most between tailoring feminine garments and masculine? I work according to, well, the principles of men's tailoring, which dictates a firm interlining, firmly padded and firmly shaped. And in general, that's something that ladies' fashion also has always favored. Of course, when we're talking about garments inspired by menswear. When I make a dress, which I only do for my girlfriend, yeah, that's a whole other process. When I make firm masculine garments, be it for men or women, the main difference is the shape and then of course subsequently the pattern you need to draft for it. Other than that, there's not a lot of difference to it. And that's so fascinating. Again, that's the thing when clothing in the 1700s started to shift away from just female exclusive into the riding habit. So the final question, what are the biggest mistakes that beginners can make and how does someone avoid them? The biggest mistake you can make is to let the first few mistakes uh, completely ruin the experience for you and make you decide not to do it. What I learned from my first project, don't immediately start with the most difficult thing. If in my case, you do start with one of the most difficult things. My first project ever was a tailcoat. Don't expect perfection because Expecting perfection is something that can really ruin it. Expect to make a lot of mistakes and expect to learn a lot from it. Expectations are a huge thing and, and you know, setting those aside and going, I need to have a more realistic approach to how this is actually going to be. Yeah, because things never usually turn out the way we plan and that's okay. Thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate you sitting down and sharing your brilliant historical tailoring knowledge with all of us. No problem. Thank you very much for having me. A massive thank you to Tom van Hethoff. Be sure to go and check out his website where he offers all sorts of bespoke historical tailoring services. He has a wonderful Instagram page as well where he posts updates about garments that he's working on and other sewing and tailoring related content. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all on Thursday for another video.